Well, thank you, Eric. Uh, I think that's right. Everybody does love maps. And what we have here tonight, I think, is a big meeting of the Friends of the Map Club. Um, I'm going to make a confession right up front. I love maps. And I'm thrilled to share some mappy ideas tonight that we can all use to amaze our friends and hopefully confuse our enemies. This talk is definitely about maps, but it's also about human perception and human behavior and psychology and politics, certainly about geography and history. So my goal is to help us look at maps with new eyes, um, see something different. Um, so let's start with something I think that perhaps we can all agree on. Maps can be incredibly useful. Remember the good old days, I, and I'm, I mean back in 2019, um, if, uh, if it was 2019, we'd all be in a lecture hall right now inside Linda Hall Library on Cherry Street in Kansas City. And I'd ask you all to give me a show of hands. How many of you used a map to find your way to the venue tonight? And I think a lot of hands would go up. And if I ask which map did you use, I think most of you would probably say this map, Google Maps. It's the most widely used of all smartphone apps, over 2 billion users every month. And along with Waze and Apple Maps and even MapQuest is still around and Mapbox and lots of other mapping applications. I think we're living in the golden age of mapping right now. Uh, most of us carry around an incredibly detailed map of the world uh, in our phone with us at all times. So Google Maps, believe it or not, has over a thousand people who work on mapping um, and they're all filtering and adding and removing and updating data. At the same time, you've got billions of people out there using this tool. And we're talking about humans here on all sides. So what could possibly go wrong? Are humans ever able to make mistakes? Well, this is what can go wrong. In, in 2019, uh, Denver airport drivers got stuck in the mud using Google Maps. A woman's home was accidentally demolished in Texas after Google Maps error. It goes on and on. Google Maps are full of lies, but humans are smart. And although not, only, not always grammatically correct, humans know how to take action to fix these high-tech problems with low-tech solutions. Uh, next week, we're going to talk more about GPS and routing, and we're going to talk about GPS stories that have happy endings and GPS stories that have sad endings. But here with these pictures, there's some anecdotal evidence that all maps, especially Google Maps, are in fact lies. So let's take a little Google Maps tour right now to the little town where my wife, Mary Jo, and I live, Aurora, Missouri, population 7,500 people. Uh, back in 2016, I took a snapshot of some Google Maps of our town. So let's have a look. When you zoom in to downtown Aurora, I was surprised to find that in the middle of a busy street, Google Maps identified a tavern uh, located there in the street. Well, that's incorrect. There is not a tavern there. They also identified a business that has never been in Aurora called Tumbleweed Two-Step. I'd love to know what they do, but they're not an Aurora business. Um, and then my favorite mistake is uh, the fact that Dadeville Senior High School, which is a town 50 miles north of Aurora, Missouri, um, is identified as being right in the center of Olive Street. So within just a few blocks of our house here in a little town of Aurora, I found three serious errors in the world's most widely used map. Well, I know what you're thinking. That was 2016. What about now? Well, um, three years later, I went back and checked those same things. And the good news is, that in 2019, all those original errors are gone. But the bad news is that Google has replaced all those errors with brand new errors. So let's take a look. First of all, here at the Aurora Police Department, there's a business there called the At The Station APD, which is identified uh, on Google Maps as a Jaguar dealer. That does not exist. So that's a lie. Um, and then over here, Arvest Bank ATM on Madison Street. Well. That's not a bank. That's um, actually now the headquarters of the Aurora School District. It hasn't been a bank since 2016. So 2016, does that ring a bell? Uh, right. Um, in 2016, on those older maps, they had it right. They showed it as the Aurora School District. But in 2019, it's wrong. So 
they took something that was right and made it wrong. Well, what are we gonna do about this? I think if you were to zoom in on Google Maps in an area that you're familiar with, you'd find errors as well. And rather than spend our time doom scrolling through Twitter or Facebook right now, one thing we can do to make the world a better place is send feedback to Google Maps. So if you zoom in on the spot where you'd like to change something and click this button in the lower right that says send feedback, this magic window opens. And Google in this window gives a full-throated admission that their maps are wrong and full of errors. If you click this button, it says fix wrong info about businesses, places, or roads that are already in Google Maps. Well, already is the key word. Not only are they admitting that the things that are there are wrong, they're admitting that things are missing. So they have other buttons on this screen to add a missing place or correct an address or add a missing road. So I think this pretty well proves that Google Maps are full of lies. Now, just for fun, if we take a look at Kansas City, where we would all be tonight, where this a uh, traditional sort of uh, meeting, um, we could uh, zoom in on Kansas City and Google Maps, and uh, this is what you'd see. Uh, look at that odd boundary. All those little towns that were swallowed up when Kansas City uh, grew, um, they're all still there. You can all still see you can see Gladstone, you can see uh, Weatherby Lake, um, all these little hamlets that are a part of Kansas City are still there. There's so many mappy stories that we could tell just by looking at this boundary. But if you do start to zoom in, the first thing you notice is there are four businesses in Kansas City, according to Google Maps, and they're those four. Why those four? Why not four different businesses? Or what is it about these businesses it makes them worthy of being the first to show up. Uh, I don't know the answer to that. I don't think anyone really knows the answer except those folks at Google. So if we zoom all the way into Linda Hall Library tonight, let's look at what Google Maps has chosen to show here. We see building footprints. Uh, some buildings are identified, some are not. Some buildings are in gray, some buildings are in a pink color or a yellow color depending on your monitor. Uh, what are the chances that there are some new businesses that may have opened in this area that are not shown, that would love to be on Google Maps? Maybe some of these are no longer there at all. And when we look at this map, think about what's missing from this map. You know, it, it seems pretty good in one sense um, if you're driving there, but what if there's a water main break and you need to know where to dig up the street to find the, the pipe? Do you think this map is any good? What if you're a, a fireman and you're coming to, uh, to the scene of a, a fire and you need to know how many stories tall are these buildings and where's the best way, place to access? That's not gonna work either. So although it's a fabulous map, it's also missing a tremendous amount of information. This is one particular map that uh, Google Maps has chosen to show us, but this is not Kansas City. This is just one view of an infinite number of views that could be shown of this very same spot on the earth. Another way to put it is the map is not the territory. So let's see what some smart people have to say about this idea of maps and the territory they represent. And I know when I say smart people, you're thinking Big Bang Theory, Sheldon Cooper, and all of his TV friends. Well, one of the guests on their show was Neil Gaiman, who's an author and graphic novelist. His uh, Sandman series, I understand, is coming soon to Netflix. So he made a guest appearance on Big Bang Theory, so that makes him a smart person. He has this to say about maps. The more accurate the map, the more it resembles the territory. The most accurate map possible would be the territory and would be perfectly accurate and perfectly useless. So he uses a lot of words there to tell us that perfectly accurate maps are no good. Uh, a, few of, uh, a man of fewer words, a 12-time Nobel Prize nominee, says everything simple is false, everything complex is unusable. So what I'm about to tell you it may seem shocking, um, because just like this earnest young lady, most of us are not savvy to the dark arts of cartography, but what I'm about to tell you is true, all maps are lies. And the problem is that most of us at school and at home are taught the Dr. Seuss version of maps. You can always use maps. They will help you in knowing where you have been and just where you are going. Well, 
Um, when it comes to words, we are taught to be very critical and to understand that things like advertising and political messages and even news can be intended to sway us or be biased. So we're taught to be cautious consumers of words, but we're rarely taught to use that same kind of caution or critical eye when it comes to maps. We are taught maps are for learning. Here, Rand McNally, one of the biggest map companies asks, did you ever look at a map without learning something? Our maps are reasonable in cost and invariably accurate. Beryl Markham writes, a map is not like a printed page that bears mere words, ambiguous and artful. A map says to you, read me carefully, follow me closely and doubt me not. I think maps have what Stephen Colbert calls truthiness and maybe more of it than any other medium of persuasion. This is from a prominent textbook on maps and cartography. Every map tells the truth by lying, like a poem with bold hyperbole of shape and line, a masterpiece of false simplicity. False simplicity plays a key role in ensuring that all maps are lies. Maps always manage the reality they try to show, or stated differently, all maps are lies. Well, if we leave behind the Dr. Seuss version of maps and start to move into a little more in-depth view of maps, this book is one that I highly recommend. It's the gold standard on this topic, How to Lie with Maps, written probably 30 years ago now by Mark Monmanier from Syracuse University. He teaches geography there. And the first sentence of this book is really the, 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 the foundation of my talk tonight. Not only is it easy to lie with maps, it is essential. So let's take a look. Let's jump into some real world examples of different ways that maps can lie. And obviously we're gonna start with a map joke. Uh, Stephen Wright has a map joke. Here's a gentle introduction to some of Stephen Wright's humor. The early bird gets the worm, but the second mouse gets the cheese. Here's a second one. I plan to live forever. So far, so good. Okay, you kind of get the idea. Here's the map joke. I have a map of the United States, actual size. It says scale, one mile equals one mile. And the punchline, I spent all last summer folding it. So not only is it a map joke, but it's a map joke about map scale. Most all maps must be smaller than the areas they depict. So the map maker has to decide what features to include and what features to omit. Map scale tells you something like one inch on the map equals a mile on the ground. But drawing maps to scale must be really hard since so many maps get it wrong. Let's say you move to beautiful Charlottesville, Virginia, and you wanna buy a house. You might turn to a map like this where the houses are numbered uh, with these black dots and then there's a corresponding picture of the house here along the edge. So if we start to zoom in a little on this map, let's say you're very interested in house number 13 and you're working at the University of Virginia. You wanna know how far is it to my house from my job? So you go out and do a little field work and you find out it's roughly about a mile up to house number 13. Well, based on that, if you're also interested in house number six out here, you would say, well, it's a little bit less than three miles out to house number six. Isn't it like we're just in Charlottesville right now looking at this map? That's one of the reasons I love maps. But would you be shocked if I told you that the house out here, number six, is not three miles, but in fact, 15 miles? Does that mean real estate people are bad at making maps or good at selling houses? You can decide that. But they've definitely distorted the map scale. In fact, this map doesn't even include a scale bar. So let's say the number one rule of map reading is if you're interested in distance and your map doesn't have a scale bar, it's probably not the map for you. And you may be thinking, well, this is a real estate map. It was never intended for you to get from point A to point B, like say a subway map. Uh, the next time you're in London, you're gonna be reliant on this subway map, the London tube map. Well, did you know that every subway map is a lie? None of the stops are, that are shown are where they are shown on the map, and none of the routes actually follow the lines that are shown on the map. Um, here's an animation to illustrate that point, starting with the tube map, and it'll morph into something a little closer to reality. The London tube map is a lie. 
And I know this is hard to believe uh, that there are distortions coming from our nation's capital, but I did find one that I could show you tonight. It's this DC Metro map. Um, hat tip to my friend John and the data is beautiful subreddit for these animated subway maps. Every subway map is a lie. Well, the US Geological Survey um, is one of the authorities on mapping and they have a document called uh, the map accuracy standard where they state errors are necessary results of mapping complex features at reduced scale. So the USGS confirms that in part because of map scale, all maps are lies. But we can have fun with map scale. I know we have some New Yorkers uh, with us tonight. Here's proof New Yorkers have their own sense of scale. The, the Saul Steinberg New Yorker cover, view of the world from Ninth Avenue. Uh, everything west beyond the Hudson River, in, including Kansas City. Kansas City is identified right there. Everything there is slightly compressed into this arid rectangle. It's all out there somewhere. That's what we know, somewhere west of the Hudson. And for the Texans in the audience tonight, greetings from the Lone Star State. What does that map tell you? That map says big equals significant and small equals insignificant, right? Well, map makers take advantage of those preconceived notions that we have about scale. Um, and fortunately, most cartographers use their mapping skills for good rather than evil, but that's not always the case. I'm gonna show you now an, a map that was used by Adolf Hitler in World War II as propaganda. It's called a study in empires. Um, and it's based on our preconceived ideas about geographic size equating to power. The message here is big equals important and powerful, i.e. the British Empire. Small, nothing here to worry about, insignificant, that's Hitler's Germany. How could they be an aggressor nation? A great example of a propaganda map. And here's one uh, from the Civil War. This is from the uh, Library of Congress collection. It's called Scott's Great Snake. 1861, um, it's an imaginary snake that is encircling the Confederacy that represents a, a plan to crush the Confederacy economically. And if you zoom in on the snake, you'll see that the snake is covered with warships that are blockading the Confederate ports. So we equate size with power, even for maps of imaginary reptiles. And if you follow the map around to the head of the reptile, it's located here in Missouri, the cartographer has even given us a shadow to make it look more imposing. You can see the American flag there on the head of the snake and the snake is running the Southerners out of Missouri. And if you were to look at this map more closely, you could see that all the Northern infantry are all in perfect uniforms and perfect alignment and everything in the South is just in total disarray. So maps have long been and continue to be powerful tools of persuasion. Map scale can also be used to our advantage to help us understand something like, say, the Great Wall of China that most of us have not visited. Um, to get a better sense of just how big it is, we can compare it to something that we're, perhaps we have visited, like some of the states in the United States. So let's overlay those two things. And that's what we've done here. The Great Wall of China in yellow, um, it helps us understand that it extends all the way from upstate New York all the way to the Texas Panhandle. And you can see too that there are many sections, some connected, some disconnected of the Great Wall. So it's a way to use map scale to help us understand something foreign or, or unfamiliar um, in terms of something with which we may be more familiar. And again, this is nothing new. This is a, a map from 1854 from the David Rumsey map collection that um, lines up very neatly for us every long river in the world from shortest to longest and every mountain in the world from shortest to tallest. So the idea is by scaling these things out, you get a relative sense of how big they are. We'll talk a little more about the David Rumsey collection um, later. So let's move on to map symbols and see how they uh, facilitate maps lying to us. Uh, we'll start with some familiar map symbols. Well, these are familiar in the United States, I should say, but if you're in Switzerland, you better pay very close attention to those maps because the things that we take for granted here um, may not be the same in other countries. 
but this is a pretty simple example. Map symbols can really go well beyond um, what can be succinctly described in a map legend. For example, uh, the women's right to vote was a big issue in 1915 when this map was published. It's called The Awakening. Um, it was published five years before the ratification of the 19th Amendment, and it's full of symbols. We have Lady Liberty here striding confidently across these Western states that are all in white. These are states that have all passed some form of uh, suffrage to give women the right to vote. She's carrying this torch of freedom high. Her, her, uh, her gown here says, uh, vote for women. And she's reaching out to these women in the Eastern states, which are colored in black. Uh, and these women are, uh, if you notice, there's 100% of the women in these Eastern states that are just dying to have what the folks in the Western states have. Their desperation is obvious. If you zoom in and take a look, they're desperate to get those same freedoms. Um, and they're also shown in fashionably short hairstyles uh, with trendy hats and clothes that would appeal to upper middle class demographics, which were the most engaged folks in the women's right to vote movement. So when you zoom back out, you, you get a sense of just what this map is, is saying. Uh, the colors, the symbology, it all is sort of adds up. And, and it was such a popular map that it actually put the, the uh, suffrage folks in a bit of a financial bind because every time another state was added, they wanted this map to be updated and, and republished. So they almost went broke updating and publishing this map um, um, with the, the good guys versus the bad guys. Uh, so while we're on the topic of maps, powerful map symbols, how about this map? It, it has a ridiculous number of symbols. It, it's so many symbols that it, it almost becomes useless unless, unless the point of the map is, look at this huge problem that we need to take care of immediately. And I think that's what this map is saying because this is a map of potholes in Indianapolis. And I chuckle when I see this absurd symbology, but in my experience, potholes are a problem everywhere, even in good old Kansas City. So here's the Kansas City pothole map, which makes a similar case, doesn't it? That there are potholes everywhere. Wait a minute, except on the Kansas side of the state line. So all pothole maps are lies as well. Now let's move out to San Francisco. These are not potholes. These are polling stations or places where you can go and vote. Now, if you were writing an article about the upcoming election and you wanted to make the case that there's a really big difference in access to voting based on where you happen to live in the country, this San Francisco map is a perfect starting point because you can take it with its map symbols that are all clumped together and you put it next to a map of polling places in Phoenix where the map, first of all, you're using different symbology so it's a little less prominent, plus it's spaced out so it really makes your case for the headline maps show disparity in polling locations between San Francisco and other major cities. Um, well, I really think an alternate headline for this map could be that maps show that San Francisco is much more densely populated than major cities in Texas, Georgia, and Arizona. Uh, because what we're looking at here on the left is one of the most densely populated parts of the United States in San Francisco, and of course, uh, Phoenix is one of the most dispersed and least densely populated places in the United States. So as a map writer, the creative use of maps can really benefit um, uh, the headline that you're trying to prove. But as a map reader, you have to be on the lookout for really population density maps that are in disguise. In general, where more people live, more things happen. And it's not uncommon to see this um, among maps that we're really just looking at a population density map. So here are two maps. Um, if you wanted to make the case that we have a really big problem and it needs immediate attention, which map would better make your case? I think it's pretty clear it would be the upper map. It has a lot of bright red colors and they're pretty well distributed across the United States. Well, would you be surprised if I told you that these two maps were made with exactly the same underlying data, exactly? Um, I'm showing you a histogram for each one on the left that shows the distribution of the different values. But 
these two maps are just an infinite number of maps that could be made from that very same data. So we're taught to be cautious consumers of words, but we're not taught often to be cautious consumers of maps. And here's an example that shows you don't even need to be a guru with mapping software to pull off this kind of thing. These maps were both created using the online tools from the US Census Bureau. You don't need a degree in GIS to be able to make these maps. And if you look at the two, they make a completely different case about the percentage of the Hispanic or Latino population in Florida, don't they? So you have to look in great detail at the, at the uh, legends and the information that these maps were uh, created from, who made them, why did they make them, what point are they trying to make? Again, two maps that appear to be similar, but upon closer inspection are quite different. Look at the headings of these two maps. U.S. Pop County population age 65 and over. Exactly the same titles, but when you look at the maps, wow, they're completely different. So let's see if we can figure out what's going on here. With this map, U.S. County population age 65 and over, in this legend it says this is total numbers. So this is just a raw count of the number of people. And so if you're selling a product that appeals to people 65 and older, this is your map because this is where they all live in the greatest concentrations. The other map is actually the percent of the population over 65. So if you're a politician and you're looking to appeal to voters over age 65 to get elected, then this is your map because this shows where the highest percentage of those people live. Two different maps that appear to be very similar, but couldn't be more different in terms of what they're trying to show. And as long as we're talking about people getting elected, let's take a look at some election maps. I know those have been flying around a lot lately. The ones I'm using here today are from 2004. And when you first look at this map, what does it say? Well, it says the red candidate won the election. Look at the geographic area that they covered, but wait a minute. Uh, do we vote based on geographic area? The answer to that is no. And so I'm going to show you here a map of U.S. census blocks that have zero population. In other words, anywhere that's green on this map, no one lives there. So if we took this map and overlaid it with the previous map, you can see that a lot of these red areas out in the west are not populated with humans at all. Nobody's voting in those areas. So it starts to show the relationship between election geography and population, but there are better ways to do that. One is a cartogram. A cartogram is a map where we redraw the states based not on their geographic size, but on the number of voters in that state. So with a cartogram, we start to get a much different view of who won that election in 2004. It looks much closer, doesn't it? And if we change our mapping units from states down to the counties, and if we change our symbology from just two colors to a whole range of colors, including some purple in the middle, we get the purple America map that makes it much more difficult to decide just who won the election. It makes the election seem much closer. It sends a different message. And as it's true with election maps and really all maps, it comes down to a question of the level of detail that the map reader is willing to, div, uh, to understand or interested in understanding as to whether these maps land and make their point. Here's a colorful world map that we're going to visit in a couple of ways here. If we zoom in to northern Africa, we see it's mostly covered with green vegetation, right? The Sahara forest. Well, no, we know that's a desert, so why is it green? Well, if we check the map legend, always read the legend, we can see that this map is colored only for elevation. It has nothing to do with land cover um, or vegetation. So that's why this uh, map shows that Northern Africa is green because of elevation. Another example of using colors on maps, USGS, topographic map. Those of you uh, may be like me, you kind of grew up with these maps and part of the reason you love maps is because these are such fabulous um, descriptive items that show elevation, they show incredible detail of small back roads and areas that are um, out in the wilderness. Some of the most accurate maps ever made. Well, this is Logan, Utah, and on the right you see a lot of green. 
Well, if you zoom in on some of those green areas uh, with the aerial photograph, you're gonna find that there's a lot of variation in land cover there. Much of it is barren with several hundred feet between individual trees. Uh, so the USGS does go to great lengths to explain how they choose the colors for these maps, but when you see green on a USGS map, it does not mean it's dense forest necessarily. To put it simply, map symbols are very tricky, and this is, I think, a good example of that. Speaking of tricky, uh, our friends Todd and Allison brought this map to my attention after they stopped to uh, camp for the night in a state park in Illinois. It helps answer the question, should a map show lakes as green or should it should a map show lakes as blue or white uh, or both so if you look at this little inset map down in the corner the lake rand lake is shown as blue but when you zoom back out to the full map the blue is actually the land and the lake is white so todd and allison found this somewhat confusing were they going to camp in the water where are the roads um it, I think it's a great example uh, that illustrates the fact that cartographers are not required to carry a license. Um, and this map, I think, drives that home. Map projections, one of my favorite topics. Back to our colorful map of the world. When you see this map, do you think it fosters European imperialist attitudes? Well, what if I told you that although Africa and Greenland appear to be about the same size, Africa is actually 14 times larger than Greenland. Hmm, how are we gonna to get to the bottom of this? I think we should call in our friend Aaron Sorkin to write an episode of the TV political drama, The West Wing, uh, to help clear this up. So we're gonna look in on a video as two of the president's senior staff take a White House meeting with a group called the Organization of Cartographers for social equality that have some strong ideas about map projections. Hi, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry to be late. Not a problem. I'm CJ Craig. Of course you are. I'm Dr. John Fallow, with Dr. Cynthia Sales, and uh, Professor Donald Huke. Huke? Huke. Okay, and you are the Organization of Cartographers for Social Equality. Well, we're, uh, we're from the OCSE. We have many members. How many? 4,300 dues-paid members. What are the dues? Now $20 a year for the newsletter. Let's start. Wait. Wait, I want to see this. This is Josh Lyman. Indeed you are. Josh, this is Dr. Fallow and Hi. two Mary men. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Should we begin? Yes. Plain and simple. Uh, We'd like President Bartlett to aggressively support legislation that would make it mandatory for every public school in America to teach geography using the Peters projection map instead of the traditional Mercator. Give me 200 bucks and it's done. Really? No. Why are we changing maps? Uh, because, CJ, the Mercator projection has fostered European imperialist attitudes for centuries and created an ethnic bias against the third world. Really? The German cartographer, Mercator, originally designed this map in 1569 as a navigational tool for European sailors. The map enlarges areas at the poles to create straight lines of constant bearing or geographic direction. So it makes it easier to cross an ocean. But yes. it distorts the relative size of nations and continents. Are you saying the map is wrong? Oh dear, yes. Now look at Greenland. OK. Now look at Africa. OK. The two land masses appear to be roughly the same size. Yes. Would it blow your mind if I told you that Africa is in reality 14 times larger? Yes. Here we have Europe drawn considerably larger than South America. When it's 6.9 million square miles, South America is almost double the size of Europe's 3.8 million. Alaska appears three times as large as Mexico, when Mexico is larger by 0.1 million square miles. Germany appears in the middle of the map when it's in the northernmost quarter of the Earth. Wait, 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 relative size is one thing, but you're telling me that Germany isn't where we think it is? Nothing's where you think it is. Where is it? I'm glad you asked. The Peters projection. It has fidelity of axis. Fidelity of position. East-west lines are parallel and intersect north-south axes at right angles. What the hell is that? It's where you've been living this whole time. Should we continue? Uh-huh. So, your problem?
probably wondering what all of this has to do with social equality. No, I'm wondering where France really is. Guys, we want to thank you very much for coming in. Hang on, we're going to finish this. Okay. What do maps have to do with social equality, you ask? She asked. Salvatore Natoli of the National Council for Social Studies argues, in our society, we unconsciously equate size with importance and even power. I'm going to check in on Toby. Go. These guys find Brigadoon on that map, you'll call me, right? Probably not. Okay. When third world countries are misrepresented, they're likely to be valued less. When Mercator maps exaggerate the importance of Western civilization, when the top of the map is given to the Northern Hemisphere and the bottom is given to the Southern, then people will tend to adopt top and bottom attitudes. But wait, how, where else could you put the Northern Hemisphere but on the top? On the bottom. How? Like this. Yeah, but you can't do that. Why not? Because it's freaking me out. C.J. Craig is freaked out by this map of the world that shows South as up. We're so accustomed to seeing North up, but this is only by convention because the Earth is floating in infinite space. There's no up or down. Uh, this map, frankly, is a shock to my eyes. It, it's the familiar shapes of all those continents are nowhere to be seen. We have to look very closely to figure out where we are. We really are seeing the world with new eyes when we turn the map with South up. And if we rotate it a little bit in a different direction, you see a duck? I see a duck. And if we swing it around a bit, I see a dead duck. So there's a lot of maps that, uh, that we can see shapes of, of animals, and uh, it doesn't take much imagination, I think, to see those. But when we talk about map projections, we're converting the three-dimensional surface of the Earth to a 2D map. So it's like peeling an orange. You can't do it and make a nice rectangle. Uh, out of it. It's, it, some people say it's like political parties, they, they tend toward distortion. That's the way map projections are, they tend toward distortion. So the, the, the Mercator projection preserves shape and direction. It was intended for mariners who had crude instruments of navigation to let them sail straight across an ocean and get to the point. But it overstates the relative size of the land masses as they get further from the equator. The Peters projection, which they showed in the map, um, distorts the shape, but it maintains the area. Some people say it looks like laundry hung out to dry. It, I, I suppose you all have your own favorite projections. I know I do. This is the Winkle triple projection. Two reasons I like it. One, it looks sort of, it's middle of the road. It doesn't preserve shape, area, distance, or direction, but it looks really good. And uh, National Geographic used it for many years as their default projection. Plus, it's just fun to say Winkle triple. The Winkle triple projection, it's my favorite. Now that you've trained, you've been trained to look for map projections, your world's gonna change because every time you see a world map now, you're gonna look at Greenland and you're gonna look at Africa. This is the current setup on uh, Saturday Night Live, Weekend Update. These are Mercator guys, but if you go back a few years to Tina Fey and her crew, they were not Mercator people. And you remember Larry King? Remember his pixelated map? Uh, there's something wrong with this map because according to Larry King, if you draw a line from Japan to California, you're going to go right through Australia. That map is definitely a lie and it does not inspire confidence. This again is nothing new, this idea of creative map manipulations using projections. Uh, let's go back in time to the 19th century in Britain. The sun never sets on the British Empire. At that point, the monarchy was really eager to brag about the extent of their empire, and there seemed to be no cartographic trick that they were not willing to pull to bolster that claim. We're going to look at a series of maps from the Cornell University Library. They have a collection called the Collection of Persuasive Cartography. Um, here's the first map. The British Empire spans the world. Well, the British Empire is shown in red. Now, this is a cylindrical projection, which means we've taken a piece of paper and sort of virtually wrapped it around the globe and then projected all those uh, continents onto that paper and then unrolled it to make it flat. Um, so we're seeing all 360 degrees of longitude here in this map and everything that's red is part of the British Empire. 
But there's no reason that you have to stop at 360 degrees with a cylindrical projection. So here's one that's 380 degrees. Now, why would you do that? Well, if you look closely down here in the lower left, we see part of Australia. And over here, we see all of Australia. So it's a way to get more red on the map. Why stop at 380? Here's 390 degrees. We get a little more of Australia. 420 degrees. Now we have all of Australia twice. Let's keep going. 450 degrees. Not only do we get all of Australia and all of New Zealand twice, but we're starting to see a little bit of India at 450 degrees. And are you starting to see a pattern here? Well, the, the British apparently pulled the plug on this cartographic trickery after the map got up to 490 degrees of longitude, where we see all of Australia, all of New Zealand, and all of India twice. Now, this map is titled The Extent and Distribution of the British Empire. That's so understated. That's so British. I'd like to set, uh, suggest an alternate title for this map. Just look at how much of the world we control. So because of map projections, I think we can say that all maps are lies. Let's just talk about some fun blunders now. Well, fun maybe, fun not maybe. This one was from The Economist magazine. They published this map using the Mercator projection and they've drawn circles, but we know Mercator proje projection does not preserve distance. So drawing a circle on a Mercator map does not give you points equidistant from the center. Um, but notice how this map that's supposed to show how far North Korean missiles can reach. The missiles only reach the middle of Alaska. Well, in the next issue of the magazine, they had to publish an updated map that actually shows the correct distance on this Mercator projection. And you can see those same missiles now can reach well into the United States. So map scale is incredibly important. Here's an example of where a, a map blunder almost caused a war between Missouri and Iowa. Um, back in 1816, when this uh, surveyor was sent out to to define the line between the two states. This was before Missouri or Iowa were, were actually states. John Sullivan went out and did the survey and he started here in the west at the Missouri River and made his way east to the Mississippi. And by the time he got to the eastern part of what would be Iowa, he was off by about 10 miles. Well, when Missouri became a state, this was sparsely populated, wasn't that big a deal, but eventually the Missouri governor hired another surveyor who made a new line, and that's this top line here. And then the federal government got involved and hired another surveyor, and that person came back with this line. So now we have three lines defining the boundary between Missouri and Iowa. The Missouri governor, Governor Boggs, who is uh, on the left here, um, he sent a very unlucky Missouri sheriff from the northern part of the state into the disputed territory to collect taxes for Missouri. He was not met with open arms. The locals ran him away with pitchforks. The governor said, go back again and do your job. So the second time, the locals in Iowa were, were waiting and jailed the governor. Uh, at that point, Governor Lucas from Iowa on the right here got his military, his militia involved. The Missouri governor sent his militia. They met at the disputed area, uh, but before any fighting actually happened, cooler heads prevailed, thank goodness. Uh, they released the Missouri sheriff from the jail. This all went to court. It made it all the way to the Supreme Court. And in 1849, the Supreme Court ruled, and they said, let's just go with that original line that Mr. Sullivan surveyed at the start. So that is now the border between the two states. But as recently as 2005, Missouri had the border resurveyed, just to be sure. Um, so because of this unintentional blunder, um, I'd have to say that those early maps were lies. There's also this idea of trap streets. Um, in order to make maps, it's very expensive. Uh, it takes a lot of time and money to go out and make a detailed map. So the Ordnance Survey map from the UK, which is a copyrighted proprietary product, um, includes something called trap streets. And this example, lie close, that's not a real street. It's only there to catch people who copy this data. Well, the UK equivalent of AAA decided they needed to make their own maps. And they took these ordnance survey maps and copied them. Ordnance survey took them to court. 
the evidence was presented that this and other trap streets were duplicated and the judgment came down in favor of the ordinance survey. That was a few years ago, but just last month, uh, the Chinese, a Chinese court awarded the equivalent of 10 million US dollars to a company which claimed that the Chinese mapping company Baidu had copied their maps based on the evidence that they had embedded in their maps of trap streets. So this continues to be a thing. Um, everybody who makes maps puts trap streets there to prevent folks from copying their data. What if I told you the Michigan Highway Commissioner was uh, a big Michigan football fan? Is it possible that he would add fake towns to the official Michigan highway map, one called Beat OSU and one called Go Blue? Well, it happened. And this is the 1978-79 Michigan map. And when you find those on eBay now, they're quite collectible. So these are blunders and Easter eggs that show up on maps. Well, uh, let's, let's have a little fun with maps here as we close. Uh, if there was a big mapping conference that was going to happen in Las Vegas, Sin City, and you were going to go there, what kind of maps would you display that might get some attention? Well, Kansas State University decided to go with this theme, mapping the seven deadly sins. So they came up with maps that include a proxy for each of the seven deadly sins. For example, the lust map there um, maps uh, sexually transmitted disease rates. Uh, envy, that shows theft per capita. Gluttony has to do with fast food restaurants per capita, et cetera. So these maps were displayed at the conference uh, and K-State's ploy worked beautifully because the internet loved these maps. When the headline is seven deadly sins maps, how does your state stack up? People are gonna click on that. Uh, this grabs a lot of attention, It grabs a lot of eyeballs. So at the time I was working at the University of Virginia, I was teaching there, uh, the university founded by Mr. Jefferson and being inspired by these KSU maps, I was wondering what could I do that might make maps that would resonate with the UVA community. I came up with this mapping our unalienable rights. So I had to come up with a proxy for Mr. Jefferson's most famous sentence that ends with life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. Life, I chose life expectancy data at birth. Liberty has to do with incarceration rates at the county level. And for pursuit of happiness, I used some data from the economic census about the number of arts, entertainment, and recreation businesses per capita. And after I made these maps, I posted them at the University of Virginia Library um, on a blog. And a few days later, I got an email uh, asking if the library could use one of these maps in their annual report. And I was really quite pleased that my efforts had been rewarded. Well, just shortly after that, I got an email from the New York Times asking if they could use the life map on one of their digital uh, postings on their arts blog. And that was quite nice to see my map up um, on the New York Times blog. And shortly after that, they got back in touch and asked if they could use the life map in the print edition. Well, at this point, I thought my cartographic career had reached the highest possible rung, but I was not at all prepared about what would happen next. Oprah's people called my people and asked if they could use the pursuit of happiness map on Oprah's blog. So it appeared there and Oprah's people suggested that mapping ice cream parlors per capita would be a great proxy for happiness. It, if uh, the, the idea was these maps should create a discussion and the map made Oprah and her people think about this topic. So I think they were successful. So we can say for sure that we love maps and we trust maps for good reason. Um, maps, unfortunately, must offer a simplified version of reality, and so, in, in essence, every map is incomplete. And the decision about what to leave out and what to include really gets to the heart of why most maps are lies. Maps are made by humans, and humans make mistakes, both intentional and unintentional. And every map is just one of an infinite number of maps that can be made about any spot on the surface of the earth. So map readers should be especially skeptical, especially in our world today where 
alternative facts have become part of our lexicon. We can all benefit from being more rigorous and skeptical map readers. And that's because all maps are lies. Now, if you're interested in reading more and learning more about this topic, I, I really do suggest Mon Manier's book, How to Lie with Maps. The third edition just came out in the last couple years. On top of that, um, if you're a Jeopardy fan, I know you're familiar with the name Ken Jennings. He was the winner of the Greatest of All Time tournament, uh, and he'll be the first guest host of the show starting in January. Well, Ken Jennings is a map guy. He's a map lover. He calls himself a map head. His book about mapping is called Map Head, and I think every topic we've touched on tonight is covered in the book, so I highly recommend it. Also, just put in your in your favorite search engine, something about maps, and you're going to come up with enough information that you can be reading for hours. I mentioned earlier David Rumsey. This is a fabulous collection of maps, over 100,000 high-resolution maps starting back in the 16th century. They're all scanned at high resolution, available for free download. The maps are actually housed at Stanford University's library, but they're all available online at davidrumsey.com. And in a couple of weeks, we're going to talk about using these historic maps to sort of uh, cast a bright light on the past and help understand what's going on today based on what happened in the past. The Persuasive Cartography Collection at Cornell University, several of the maps I showed tonight came from this collection. 800 maps, every single one of them intended to influence opinion and send a message. Again, free downloads, high resolution scans, beautiful metadata. At the outset, I said I love maps. Well, I also love libraries. My, my wife is a librarian. Uh, librarians make researching maps and every other imaginable subject uh, easy and very possible. So thank you to all the libraries um, that have contributed to the knowledge of maps. Um, Eric talked about the three talks that we're doing. Uh, this one about lot maps being lies. A week from tonight, we're going to talk about mapping yourself with GPS. We're going to answer the question, does your phone receive Russian GPS signals? Spoiler alert, the answer is yes. Um, is GPS different in the morning than it is in the afternoon? The answer is yes. And then two weeks from now, we're going to talk about how to take full advantage of historic maps so that we can see more clearly into the past. So I think we've seen well over 100 maps tonight. Um, hopefully, you found some things that you can use to amaze your friends and confuse your enemies. And my hope is that you really do start to look at maps now with new eyes. So I see Eric's back on the screen. Uh, I know we have a few minutes left here for discussion. So I'd like to talk about maps. What questions do you have that have come in from our viewers, Eric? Yeah, and just as a reminder for everyone, if you have a question, type it in the Q&A chat box. You'll see at the bottom of your screen. If you're on Facebook, the comment section, uh, and we'll try to uh, get to as many as possible. I do want to point out, uh, you mentioned uh, Mon Monnier. Yes. Uh, the author. The Linda Hall Library, I, I checked our catalog as you were talking about him. We have eight of his books. We do not yet have his one about maps or lies. I, I forget the exact title, but- uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, How we'll to Lie with Maps. Yeah, How to Lie with Maps. We'll, we'll definitely get that on order. But we have eight other uh, <laughs> uh, books about maps of his. Uh, all right, let's get to the questions. Did you invent the word mappiness? And, and, and what is your definition of that? <laughs> Uh, I, I can't claim that I invented it. I don't know. Uh, I don't know who invented that word, but um, mappiness to me is kind of a combination of maps and happiness. Uh, every time I look at a map, I smile. And I thought that word mappiness really kind of conveys the, the thinking that not only are maps uh, great for communicating information, but they, they just put me in a happy place. Are, are water maps more accurate? Water maps? Water maps, uh, you know, maps of, I guess, maps of oceans or lakes. Um, yeah, that's thoughts a good about question. That? You know, the, water bodies, uh, unfortunately, water bodies often feel the wrath of cartographers uh, because they're, they're, they tend to be simplified when you look at maps, unless you're looking at a map that is intended, intended just to show the boundary of a lake or a stream, we know that over time, those things all change, right? Every time there's a flood, the, the, 
the, uh, the stream channel changes whenever there's higher or lower water, the boundary of lakes change. And so cartographers tend to sort of generalize those things and, and simplify their maps by not going into great detail. Um, so one of the, the most beautiful series of maps I've ever seen were done by a cartographer for the US government that shows the channel changes for the Mississippi River over a lengthy period of time. I don't have the reference off the top of my head, but um, I don't think you can really say in general terms that maps of water bodies are any more or any less detailed. It's just a matter of what the intent was of the cartographer. If it was intended to be a map of a water body, then it's probably pretty accurate. If it was intended to be a map of something else, then the water body may not have, the water body may get short shrift. We have a comment here uh, that uh, gives an example of a point you made during your talk. Uh, and the comment is, I found maps in the Canadian market give a different perspective of North America than maps in the US market. Well, I bet that's right. I mean, um, it's interesting as you travel around the world and you look at maps that are intended for dis, uh, consumption by folks in other countries. You know, we're so accustomed here in North America to seeing every map centered with the United States at the center of the map. If you go to Europe, their maps are centered with Europe at the center of the map. If you go to Russia, their maps are centered with Russia at the center of the map. Everybody believes they're at the center of the map. There's a uh, uh, there was a fellow in Australia who made a famous map where Australia is at the center of the map. And believe it or not, that map sells incredibly well in Australia. So uh, everybody likes to be at the center of the map. Um, and as you move around the world and look at maps generated in those countries, you're going to see drastic differences from what you're accustomed to seeing here in North America. And it varies state by state, too. I remember being in Hawaii and watching the local news, and they had a map but, you know, behind the broadcaster and uh, Hawaii was depicted, you know, probably a hundred times larger than its actual size. It just took up a large swath of the Pacific Ocean. Yeah. Um, yeah. Is there a cartographer's oath, like the Hippocratic Oath? And if, <laughs> if, 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 if not, who do you think exemplifies the best practices of map truthiness? Yeah, that's a good question. There is a, an organization um, that certifies people in the, the discipline of geographic information systems, GIS. That's the software that's most often used to create maps and do map analysis and geographic and spatial analysis. And part of the process for acquiring a certification in through the GIS Certification Institute is a an oath um, that you take about um, honesty and, and being forthright in, in your mapping practices. Uh, so that is a part of the process if you go through that certification, which thousands and thousands of people have done. Um, uh, to, to, it, it's fairly new, but it's something that I think is really uh, caught on in the mapping discipline. Uh, frankly, the vast majority of people who make maps have no uh, have, have sworn no allegiance to any, uh, any oath of honesty or integrity whatsoever. In fact, as the years go by, it's become much, much easier for just anyone to make maps because there are so many more tools now that are available um, for free or very low cost that allow you to take data sets and manipulate them in practically any way you want to make, uh, to make maps. So it, it really just behooves the map reader to pay greater attention to who made the map, who paid for the map? Why was the map made? Are they trying to sway my opinion? And look a little bit deeper beyond just assuming that everything on a map is true. All right, and uh, if you look in the chat box, uh, my colleague Ashley has posted a link to Monmonier's works in the li Linda Hall Library catalog. You can just click on that and see the books that are available for checkout. Um, Got a question from Marcos, uh, who writes, I am hoping to geofence the canals in South Florida. What are my best resources? 
Yeah, so geofencing, uh, if I understand what Marcos is talking about there, that's a, that's a technique where you use a GPS device in, cor in, in correlation with uh, a map, maybe a mobile mapping application so that as you get closer to a particular point, you're, you're notified uh, of that. Um, uh, maybe the, the most common uh, implementation of that is uh, the, the, the dog fencing that's, that people use in their yards where you, they bury a small wire and then the dog wears a collar. That's, uh, that may be what he's talking about. I know that that's, um, there, are, there are different vendors that specialize in that sort of thing. Um, I can't really recommend one off the top of my head, but I know not only is it used for that kind of thing to keep pets in the yard, but out in the, the western part of the United States, there are some examples of using that same technology to use to move cattle from one uh, piece of uh, grassland to the next by not actually erecting any fence, but by using geographic fences with the cattle are um, um, equipped with uh, basically a, a shock collar and you can move the fence by just making a line on a map and then sort of rotate the cattle through different grazing pastures over time. So, um, you know, th there's a there's a good aspect to this to use for positive things. And then um, you don't have to think too deeply about George Orwell and some of his works to realize that uh, some of these technologies can also be used uh, for evil or uh, for controlling folks. So um, maybe that answers the question. All right. Um... You talked about uh, where there was almost a border, a, a real border war between Missouri and Iowa. Do you know of um, examples of map errors that have ever led to un unintended attacks in war zones? Well, I don't, I don't know of examples, specific examples off the top of my head about attacks in war zones, but anytime humans are involved and there's technology, especially in a war situation, uh, GPS, we're going to talk about this more next week, but there's always uh, technology available to help to sort of jam GPS or confuse GPS that can lead to uh, unexpected consequences that way. Um, I mentioned early in the talk uh, an example with Google Maps where a woman's house was demolished accidentally because um, the, the team that was supposed to demolish the house showed up on the wrong block. Google Maps later admitted that they they had made a mistake and that the folks had actually gone to the correct address according to Google Maps. But if it happens in Texas with Google Maps, I guarantee it's gonna happen during a war situation where something unexpected happens and uh, relying on the technology may not uh, produce the desired outcome. Yeah, just a few, you know, a few yards off or a mile off could uh, make a big deal in those situations. Um, That's right. We're, we're uh, running past the hour, so let's uh, wrap up with this question, uh, which I think is an interesting one. Uh, Catherine writes that when she was a child, she was given a 3D topographical map and loved to run her hands over it. Uh, uh -huh. um, did you have maps uh, that you loved when you were young that uh, kind of made you into a, a lover of maps? Well, um, yeah, you know, I grew up on a farm and I remember uh, at some point there was a salesman who came by and, and uh, had a, an aerial photograph of our farm. And uh, my parents purchased that and we had it in a frame in the house. And I used to look at that uh, over and over and try and sort of equate what I'm seeing from the air with what I knew about the place from being there on the ground for so many years. That, that idea of taking a picture from a bird's eye view and, um, and sort of giving you the ability to, to be omnipotent in what you can see was something that was very appealing to me as a kid. Of course, I think I had the same experience as a lot of people did at my age where the parents would put us in the back of the station wagon and we'd go on vacations together. Somebody in the car was always responsible for having a map. Uh, dad and mom would sometimes um, disagree about the best route and, and discussions would ensue. So maps were always a part of, of growing up for me. And I think a lot of people shared that same experience. But I, I know what she's talking about with those three-dimensional maps. If you go to uh, national parks, you often see those three-dimensional maps there in the visitor center that give you a mm -hmm. sense of where you are in relation to the rest of the items in the park. And um, 
there's always a shiny spot on the top of the mountains where people have been rubbing on the map. So I think they're very popular and have been forever and, and will continue to be. I love those too. We actually have some of those in the library that uh, every time I go down to our map room, I enjoy, I enjoy <laughs> looking at. Uh, Kelly, thank you so much uh, for just a wonderful presentation tonight. Well, you're welcome, Eric. I'm happy to do it, and I'm looking forward to continuing the fun next week when we talk about GPS. Yep, uh, and, and thank you, everyone. And as Kelly just mentioned, next week, December 10th, same time, 7 p.m. Central. And if you're watching right now, that means you're already registered. You don't have to do anything else except look for your look in your email inbox for the next Zoom link that we'll send out a day or two prior to the program. So Kelly, thank you again. And thank you everyone for tuning in tonight. And I look forward to seeing you back here next week at the same time. Thank you and have a great rest of your evening. Thanks, Eric.